Um, so, uh, firstly, who are the LJC? Um, so, for those of you who this is your first event, who you haven't seen um, Robin's previous two talks or any of our previous talks, or, or tuning in afterwards, I know we're getting people from all over the world at the moment now that we can do this uh, through Zoom. Um, the LJC is the London Java Community, um, or the London Java uh, Meetup Group. Um, we are, um, we're 13 years old, we were founded in November 2007. Um, we've got 7,000 or almost 7,500 members now. Um, and we've run over 600 events, in fact, closing in on our 700th now. Um, but bigger than the, the numbers here, um, the whole thing has got these real community uh, values to it around mentoring, learning and, and supporting each other. Um, a lot of the, uh, the events that we run have, have been run through, uh, through LJC members that have, that have come up and, and are now speaking at conferences. Um, as for who I am, my name is Barry Cranford. I'm the, uh, I'm the founder of the group. Um, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a developer myself. Uh, I'm in fact a recruiter. I run a uh, recruitment company called RecWorks, um, which you, you may have heard uh, a few things about. Uh, so if I can go on to the next slide here. It's not going to let me, is it? Uh, so RecWorks, so who, um, who we are. Um, basically, we, as a business, our, our belief in, in, uh, in the industry is that recruitment can be a, a power or a force of good um, beyond just, just getting people jobs. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is, is we, um, we, we see ourselves at the, at the heart of an industry. Uh, we obviously speak to developers uh, all day, every day. Um, and, and for us, it pays to be uh, in touch with, with the very best. We speak to graduates coming into the industry. We speak to people relocating into the industry. Um, we, we basically exist at, at the heart of an industry. So we want to be able to use our, our position there as a way to bring uh, our network together uh, to, to really help the, the whole industry learn, develop, and, and grow as a whole. Um, so, so what we do sits somewhere between giving back to people that we've worked with and, and paying forward to people that we hope to work with at one point in the future. Uh, so a few examples, obviously the events that we have had in the LJC. Uh, we organize all the, all the LJC events. Uh, we also have made now 2,000 mentor introductions through our Meet to Mentor community. Um, and we've got a new uh, group, which is Aspiring Speakers. Um, so if anybody out there is interested in being the next Robin Moffat of the future, um, then, then come and see us. Um, it's all free. Everything that we do is all free and it's all powered by uh, recruitment in that the, the only money that we make as a business comes from making placements and then a, a portion of that money goes into to running these community initiatives. Anyway, with that, I'm going to get out of, uh, of everyone's way. I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to the main man uh, this evening, uh, which is Robin. If I can figure out how to stop sharing. Um, so Robin is, again, if you haven't seen the, uh, the first two uh, events, uh, Robin is a, uh, a developer advocate, sorry, I've lost everything here, uh, at Confluent, um, who are the, uh, the company that were founded by the creators of uh, Apache Kafka. Um, been speaking at conferences since 2009, um, including QCon, DevOps, and Strata. Um, and yeah, this is his third, the final, final of the trilogy. So Robin, I'll, I'll hand over to, uh, to you at this point. Cool. Thanks very much for the, uh, the introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Robin Moffat. I'm a, a developer advocate at Confluence. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here and get my, uh, my Zoom things sorted out so I can see what's going on. Um, so yes, this is my, uh, my third uh, meetup, my third Wednesday doing these. Um, thank you so much to RecWorks for organizing these, for hosting them. Um, it's fantastic what they're doing and keeping the community going and bringing people together. So my thanks to them, uh, to Barry, to Dom for, for organising it. So I started off this series, uh, this little trilogy, by doing an example of a streaming data pipeline. And uh, the talk was recorded. It's online. You can go and find the slides. You can find the code for it and the recording. And that was showing how you can use Apache Kafka and how you can pull together um, Kafka Connect and KSQL DB to build complex streaming data pipelines just using JSON configuration and using SQL. Um, so if your background is in more in the kind of data engineering side of things, this is actually really powerful. And even if it's not, it's also kind of cool and useful to be able to use as and when it fits your use case. So that was the, the first one. And then last week I did a deep dive into Kafka Connect, the integration API for Apache Kafka. Um, again, the slides, the recordings are online. I'll share all of the links uh, afterwards. 
And this week, I want to talk about key SQL DB. So key SQL DB is the other bit that I showed uh, the first week round. And key SQL DB lets us do stream processing on data passing through Apache Kafka, but it also lets us take data in Apache Kafka and define materialized views that we can query directly. And this is where the DB bit of the name comes from and what I'm going to explain and show you this evening. But it's actually really, really cool what you can build with it. But if we kind of like just think about Kafka itself to start with, at the heart of everything that we've got in Kafka is the log. So the Apache Kafka log is this immutable series of events. So we've got these events that are flowing into Kafka and we want to do different things with those events. What we want to do with them depends on the application that we're building. But let's think about a factory, for example. We've got a factory, factories will be instrumented, they'll have all sorts of data being collected. So maybe it's a production line and there's widgets being created. And from one of the machines creating these widgets, we get a set of data. So the machine tells us when the reading was taken, maybe an ID for the sensor, the production line it operates on, information about the widget being created, what it weighed when it was created, all these kind of like just bits of data. It's an event, okay? It's an event, it tells us something happened and tells us information about it. So various people are gonna have various bits of interest in this data, but the data is where everything starts. The event is where everything starts. So we capture that into Kafka and we're then gonna to wanna to do different things with it. So maybe we want to drive some alerting. Maybe simply want to simply say, if a widget gets created and it's the wrong weight, then we need to do something about it. Or we want to report on what's going on. How many widgets have we created? Or do a slightly more complicated um, alert and say, well, let's look at the average temperature across these things or the, um, an aggregate of the number of things that have been created within a time frame, and based on that aggregate, do an alert, so a predicate based on that but we can respond to these events as they're happening. But sometimes we just want to take that data that's been created and go and shove it somewhere else. Go and put it into our data warehouse, into our data lake, to do longer term ad hoc analytics on it, to use it to train machine learning algorithms. But all of these uses for the data start with the events. So the events that we've got, it's a stream of events. This is what Kafka is. It's a, a platform that lets us work with streams of events. So events happen over time, it's unbounded, it doesn't finish, it's kind of like an infinite stream of events, and things are happening over time. So if we think about a stream of widgets, for example, and we've got widgets, they've got red colors and yellow colors, and we want to do something to them. We want to say, well, as these widgets come in, the ones which are red, we want to copy those over to a new stream. So the yellow ones, we just leave them in the original source, the red ones, we want to filter out that source stream as the events arrive, and we want to copy them out to a new stream. So how do we do that? Well, we want to process that stream. We're not saying, let's wait for all of the widgets to arrive and then kind of take that and process it and copy across all of the red ones into a static batch of data. We want to say, as these events arrive in our system, let's process them. And if they match the predicate we've defined, if they match the color equals red, we're going to copy them onto this other stream. And the result of this operation is another stream. So we're not taking batches here and processing them and writing batches there. Instead, we're taking a stream here, kind of like a living, unbounded stream of events continually arriving, and we're creating another stream of events. And that stream of events, we can subscribe to an application or push somewhere else for analytics, but it's another stream. So we could create this with Kafka Streams. Kafka Streams, it's a Java API. It's part of Apache Kafka. So we bring this Java library into our applications and we can do stream processing using this. So if you're using Apache Kafka, you've got Kafka Streams already, it's part of Apache Kafka, and you can go and write your stream processing with this. And it does very clever things and makes it much more easy than if you were to use the native consumer API of Apache Kafka, once you actually want to start filtering and processing and aggregating this data, it gives you those uh, semantics with which to work with the data. But you don't always want to use Java. Sometimes, and I'm aware of my audience today, the London Java community, so I realize this may sound a little bit weird, but maybe Java's not your first thing. Maybe actually sometimes it's simpler to use a different approach. And this is where KSQLDB comes in, because with KSQLDB, you can use SQL to express the transformation that you want to do. 
So you can say, I want to create a new stream, and I'd like to create that stream as the results of a select against the inbound stream with this given predicate. So what this looks like using our example uh, event data here and the different use cases we've got is this. We can say, well, we want to create an alert. So we're going to, to look at all of the inbound data. I'm going to filter it for predicates. We're going to say, select everything from this inbound stream of widget readings where the weight is over our threshold. If a widget gets created that's heavier than it should be, let's know about it now so that we can stop the production line and not kind of create a whole bunch of stuff that we have to recall or chuck away before because we didn't find out about it in time. We can say, as these things are being created, let's create an alert if it falls outside of our given threshold and we know about it straight away. It creates a new stream of events. We can subscribe to that stream of events. Our event-driven application can fire a notification or do a certain action based on an event arriving in its topic. We can do aggregations. We can say, let's look at how many widgets are being created by production line. We could break it down by a time window as well. How many widgets have been created per uh, hour time slice broken down by production line? And we can take those aggregates and we can filter on them. Let's look at the average temperature on each widget that's being created, group it down by the sensor ID, and if it's over a certain threshold, again, we can produce a new event to a new topic, which can be used to drive alerts or actions. But we don't always want to drive things directly from these events as they're happening. Sometimes we simply want to take these events and put them somewhere else. So we can do that. We can say, let's create a connector, taking data from this topic and push it down to that place over there. Go and push it into our data warehouse, go and push it into our data lake, use S3 or Snowflake or wherever we want to put that data by creating a connector. And we can do all of this within KSQL DB. So KSQL DB is part of Confluent Platform. It's source available licensed. It's the Confluent community license if you want to get into the detail of it. And you can use KSQL DB alongside Apache Kafka to transform your streams of data, to materialize the state from your data and query that state directly. KSQL DB integrates with Kafka Connect, which we talked about last week, and you can go and check out the recordings to understand more about that. But because it integrates with it, and that create sync connector that I showed you, that's the Kafka Connect piece. Because it does that, it means you can integrate KSQL DB directly with your source and target applications for the data, as well as the native streams themselves. So at its heart, KSQL DB acts as a consumer of data in a Kafka topic. So we have data coming into Kafka. You've got a source stream of data from wherever that data is coming from into a Kafka topic. And from there, KSQL DB can read that Kafka topic. The data can be JSON or Avro or Protoboff or CSV. However you want to have that data in Kafka, KSQL DB supports various different serialization formats. So we can read that and then you write a SQL statement to process it. And the output from KSQL DB is simply another Kafka topic. So it streams from KSQL DB back and produces to a Kafka topic. Because the output from each step of KSQL DB is a Kafka topic, it means that you can use KSQL DB as much or as little in your applications that you're building. You might decide to build kind of like a full blown thing out of KSQL DB and have various different things daisy chained together. You could say, I'm gonna do one transformation, I'm gonna cleanse the data out to a topic, and then I'm gonna consume that data again into KSQL DB again to do further processing on it. But you might also say, well, I'm simply gonna use KSQL DB to consume a stream of data, tidy it up a little bit, write it back onto a topic, and then that data is just going to head downstream to a database or somewhere else for some other purpose. You could also say, I'm going to use KSQL DB. It's going to filter a stream of data for a given condition that I'm interested in. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could simply say, here's a stream of orders, and I'd like to know about when orders reach a certain status. When they reach the shipped status, we've got a service over here that wants to know as soon as orders move into that status, and then we can write that back to a Kafka topic and our applications, our services can subscribe to that topic and they get notified as soon as orders enter that state. So the various different uses for KSQL DB. And the other piece of it, the kind of like the DB part of it, is that you can actually build materialized views within KSQL DB itself. So this is where we have a stream of data coming in from, to a Kafka topic from anywhere. 
k equal db reads that topic, and in k equal db we define a materialized view using a SQL statement, which says build this aggregate. So take this stream of information, maybe transactions on a given account, create a summary of that. So take the transaction amount and do a sum against it, group it by the account ID. And now within k equal db, we have a materialized view of the current balance of different accounts. So with that, we can then query it from our applications directly. So our service down here, and this may or may not be the same service that's also consuming from the topics that we've written to, it could be a completely different one. The service down here can go directly to that state within k equal db and say, I'd like to know what the balance is for this given account. For this given account, account ID uh, 42, go to the state store, do a key value lookup, and tell me what is the current value for that key. In case equal db, we'll say, here is the current value. I've got the current state of that key, and it's this. The balance for uh, ID 42 is 94. But what we're doing here is we're taking a stream of events from a Kafka topic, we're materializing that into state, which is maintained within case equal db, and we can query that state directly. So applications that we build that need to kind of take a stream of events and access that state, and we'd usually think, oh, well, let's go and write that down to a NoSQL store or go and write it to a relational database. Some of the time you can actually think, well, I've got the data as a source of event, as a stream of events. So that stream of events, I can materialize that state directly within k SQL DB and query it from there. So let me show you some of these things in action. I'm going to use uh, this demo script. Um, if you've been on the previous two uh, talks, you'll know that all of this stuff is on GitHub. So there is a repository, Confluent Inc. slash demo scene. You can go and find all of the demos that I've run here and a bunch of other ones. And there's a Docker Compose. So you can say Docker Compose up. Um, and then you get the full environments, which I'm using here. There's also one of the instructions as well. So you've got the demo script that I'm about to walk through here. You can actually go and try it out for yourself. Whilst I'm on my web browser here, I'll point out this as well. So uh, talks.armoff.net is where I share all of my different slides. And you can find the, uh, this evening's slides and the previous uh, slides from previous weeks, as well as the recordings on there. So if you do the Twitters, I'm at armoff. Um, you'll find me on Twitter. I'll share all of these slides on Twitter afterwards. Uh, so you can go and get them from there. So let's have a look at this demo. What we've got here, is I've got two different case equal command prompts. The reason for that is we're about to do some streaming stuff and I want to show you as I create event streams and populate them, what the effect of that is. So I'm gonna first off create a stream within case equal DB. And I'm gonna talk about some concepts here, which I'll come on to later and actually explain in much more kind of detail and the theory and definitions behind it. But within case equal DB, we have two primary types of object. We have streams and we also have tables. So we're going to start off with a stream. We're going to create ourselves a stream of movements. And this is kind of like a slightly creepy application where we're going to track people. We're going to say this person was at this particular place. So within, in terms of the schema, we're actually going to use the Kafka metadata itself of the timestamp and the key to track timestamp and person. So the only actual additional column we need is the location. So locations of Archer, the key, the message key is going to be the person, the timestamp is going to be the event time. We're going to store it as JSON. We could use Avro, we could use Protobuf, we're going to use JSON now. We're going to have a single uh, partition and we're actually going to create a Kafka topic at this point. You can also create a stream um, on top of an existing topic. What I'm going to do here is actually populate a brand new topic. So we create that stream and it says stream created. So now, before I start putting any data into that stream, in my second window down here, I'm just gonna run a select. So we're gonna say select, we're gonna reformat the row time, which is the metadata, the timestamp of the event. Um, we're gonna call it event timestamp. We're gonna take the row key and we're gonna alias it as person. And then we've got location from movements. And here, we're doing what's called a push query. I'll talk about the differences later on, but little mental note, this is called a push query, it's going to emit changes, it's going to give our client back any change that happens to that stream of events. So we run that and it says, well, okay, I'll give you a select from that stream when something happens. But so far, nothing's happened because there's nothing on that stream. Let's change that. Let's go and put some data into that stream. 
So we're going to insert into this stream. We're going to insert into the uh, row key. Uh, it's going to have the value of Robin, that's me, and the place is going to be York. So we insert into that stream, and down here, our select has said, okay, we've got a new event. Here's the event timestamp, 1921 uh, BST, and that's now, that's me, and that's my location. Well, it's not technically my location, because actually I'm in a place called Ilkley up north. This is okay, their place has changed, so now we've got another movement associated with them. We can say it's the same person, and this is their location. So let's give it a couple more uh, locations. We've got to have another one here. This is all rather fanciful, this idea that I could actually be in different places nowadays. I'm firmly in Ilkley and Ilkley alone. Um, but at one point, this example actually made sense. And with that data that we've inserted into it, we can see we've been putting data into this stream of events. We've got a query of the stream of events here. But we're talking about Kafka here. We're talking about Kafka topics. And you'll see this stream that we created has got a Kafka topic defined against it. So let's have a look at that. Show topics. The topics we've got is one, uh, one uh, called movements. Let's do that. And what we can actually say is print movements from beginning. So never mind selects, never mind schemas, just dump the contents of this topic from the beginning. This is all okay, here we go. Here's the topic called movements. The key is a string, the value format uh, is JSON. Here's our data, here's our row time. So there's the Kafka message metadata. Um, these, this is the time that we inserted the row. The key is Robin, and here's the value. So there's our different locations. So we've actually got three different bits to the payload here that we're capturing, the time, the person, and their location. But the person is giving our message key, the time is our message timestamp. So the only actual column that we needed to define was location. And we could define a much more complex schema, we could nest things, we could have arrays and all sorts of stuff. I'm just keeping it dead simple to start with. So we've done that. And what we can do now is we can actually filter that stream of data. So let's cancel that and shove this out of the way and move back up here. So at the top of the screen, I've got a clean case equal prompt. And I'm going to do two things. First off, I'm going to say this, set auto offset reset to earliest. When you're working with case equal DB, you can tell it, query the Kafka topic, either from the beginning of the topic or from the end of the topic because Kafka stores data. So we put data into Kafka, that doesn't get deleted just because someone's read it. It only gets deleted when we tell Kafka to delete it based on it's been there for a certain amount of time or for a certain size of the topic, or indeed we can tell it just keep that data forever. So what we're saying to Kafka, read from the beginning of the topic and now select the same data, so our timestamp and our person, but we're gonna use a predicate. We're gonna say, well, let's filter that data. Just show me when the person is in Leeds. And because we're not sure if they'll uh, use uppercase or lowercase or a mixture, let's actually use a function against that data. Okay, so, so far we can see that this person, Robin, he was in Leeds at this particular time here. But if we remind ourselves what the actual data in the topic looks like, so at the bottom of the screen here, let's just dump that topic out again, print movements from beginning. We can see there have been three different events, York, Ilkley and Leeds. And because it's such a simple schema, and because there are only three messages, we can eyeball that and we can say, well, quite obviously we're interested in leads. It was that row there. But imagine this is more than just one person. Imagine this is kind of like some kind of like creepy government thing was they're surveying like tons and tons of people. And you've got data coming in at thousands or hundreds of thousands of messages a second. And you want to create a stream of, I just want to know when people are in this particular place or this person I'm interested in, write all of their, that person's movements to a new stream. So by being able to filter that stream by saying, this data's got a schema, and we're gonna use SQL with a predicate on it to simply filter that data, it's kind of useful. But at the moment, we're just writing it to, us, to the screen, which is marginally useful. But even more useful is if we actually persist that to a new topic. So we're gonna do that here. We're gonna say, create stream leads users with Kafka topic called leads users. If I didn't define that, it would just take the Kafka topic name from the name of the stream, but we're just making it nice and clear what's going on here. We're creating a stream. It's backed by a Kafka topic and it's going to be populated by the results of this select. Select everything from movements where the location is leads and it changes. So we go and create that. And if I say show topics, it says, okay, you've got a new topic. You've got a topic called leads users. Print leads, oops, not that one. Print leads users, and we probably need to quote it. 
from beginning. I said, okay, you've got a Kafka topic and it's got one message in it. And that comes about from this one here that matched. But if we go down to the bottom and we insert some new data, okay, so I'm gonna insert a chunk of data. They're gonna move around Yorkshire, various different places. So when I hit enter, it's gonna insert those four different events into that Kafka topic. And we're gonna expect this topic up here, this leads users one, to pick up any new messages that match our predicate. So let's hit enter and see what happens. It says, okay, there we go. We've picked up our new message. That person then was in leads. But what we're doing here is all about the events. They were here, then they were here, then they were here. And if an event matches a predicate, like this person was at this place, we're routing it to a new topic. And that's kind of useful, depending on what we're actually doing. But what about if we want to know where someone is now? What about if we want to know state? So we've got our key, which is our person, so me, and we also know for that person, where are they currently? What's their latest place? What's the, the state? And we can do that using key SQL DB and our other object type, which is a table. So key SQL DB streams and tables are both just semantics on top of a Kafka topic. Kafka topics underpin everything we're doing here. We're either consuming from a Kafka topic or producing to a Kafka topic. We've just got some kind of like semantics on top of that, declaring how we actually want to work with that data. So a key SQL DB stream is a Kafka topic with a schema. We've said it's got a, um, a row key, which we're gonna call person, it's got a location, and it's in JSON, and this is our, our key SQL DB stream. It's kind of like a topic, but just with a schema. Whereas a key SQL DB table is still a Kafka topic, but we're saying for each key, I would like to know what the current state is. So key value, basically. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna create ourselves a table and we do it like this. I can copy and paste this from a cheat sheet. Okay, so create a table movements T because I'm not very imaginative. So we're gonna put T on it because it's a table. Again, we only actually need to declare one bit of the schema, which is the location because the key and the timestamp are implicit because they're part of the message already. We're gonna create it based on uh, this topic called movements, which is the one we're populating already. Uh, so if I just remind you down here, show topics, we've got two topics. We've got one called movements. So I print movements from beginning. This is the topic which our table is gonna be going against. So here's our different events here. Here's our common key. Now different locations at different times. So we're gonna create this table and it says, okay, I've created the table show tables, we've got a table. And we can query that table. So let me show you this. I'm gonna create myself, let's do this. Let's create yet another window because you can never have too many windows. I'm gonna load up another case equal DB prompt, which is gonna be there. So we've got one at the top and this is gonna be querying the movements table. So the movements table is telling us for this given key, what's the current state? This is okay. Here's the current state for this key. Robin is currently in Leeds, allegedly. Our next one is gonna be a stream. And our stream, we're gonna set the offset to earliest. So it does that. And then, oops. This one here, we're gonna query from the stream. So at the top here, we're querying the table. Here, we're querying the stream. They're both underpinned by the same Kafka topic, except we're saying, here is my stream of events, here is my current state. And you'll notice that your current state is your latest event. Now down here, let's cancel that, and let's move around a little bit. So Robin is gonna to go to Sheffield. So Robin goes to Sheffield, and now we've got a new event, which is right, but we've also got a change in the state. And the reason we know about that change is because we said, init changes. Tell me whenever the state changes. Whereas if I actually go back up to my table at the top and I say, just show me the current state. It says, well, here is the current state. The current state for Robin is, well, he's in Sheffield. So if the state changes, it emits it. But if we go and query it, it says, well, here's the current state for that table. But it's all coming from the same topic. And it's called this stream table duality. You can take a stream of events and you can materialize that into state. 
and you can actually take changes to state as a change log, which is a stream of events. Now, let's have a look at another type of table. So this table, let's uh, close this one down here, just get ourselves a bit more space. The other type of table that we have is still a table, but the other use of a table, I should say, is when we build aggregates. So again, let's set the offset to the earliest, just to make sure. And this time we're going to create an aggregate, which is going to tell us about statistics for a given person. So we're going to say for each person, so that the row key, our, our key for the Kafka message is that person, tell me how many times has their location changed? So that's simply a count of the number of movements. Count star from movements, that's each time they move, um, is, a move is a location change. But then tell me how many different places they've been to. So a distinct uh, count of the locations, select it from our movements stream and group it by row key, group it by the person. So we create a table and now we've got another key value state that we can look at. So we can say show tables. This is our, our movements table, which tells us about where they are currently. And they've got this one here, which tells us information about them, how many different places they've, they've been to, how many unique places have they been to. And I can query that table. I can say, go and tell me about this particular person or tell me about the people. We are, we're only tracking one person at the moment. So a person, Robin, has been to eight different, sorry, has moved location eight times and five different places. And if we go and insert some data, so from Sheffield, I'm going to go to Bartley. And so now our aggregate up here changes because the state has changed. So we've been to nine different places. And because we've not been to Otley before, the number of uniques changes as well. So it's six. And if we go back to somewhere else and insert another movement, so let's go back to Sheffield, you can see the location count uh, changes. It's 10, but the unique locations are still six because we've been to Sheffield before. So you can build up these aggregates based on a stream of events. All we're capturing into Kafka is our stream of events. And we've declared this materialized view in case equal DB saying group it by this particular key here and work out these different columns. We're just saying count the number of locations. We could say what was the first time they moved, what was the last time they moved and any other aggregates you can think of building. And so far, we're just doing this, emit changes. Tell me when this aggregate changes. Tell me when the values change. But you can also say, tell me what the current value is. And this is what's called a pull query. So here, same query, but without emit changes. Select these values from this table where it's Robin. It says, well, this is the current status. And it says this magic thing here, query terminated. Because it's not waiting. So if I go and run that again, but I say emit changes, it says, here's the current value. But then it says, press control C to interrupt. And you get your flashing cursor because that value might change. And if it changes, it's going to tell you about it because you said emit changes. I'm going to push those changes to you. It's called a push query. Whereas if I say, just tell me what the current value is, it says, well, here's the current value. It's a key value look at. What's the value for this key? Here's my key where the person is Robin, what's the value? Here are my values. And then it says query terminated and you're back at the command prompt. And these pull queries, you can actually do externally. So KSQL DB has got a, a REST API. So here we're going to invoke it. So we're just going to use the query endpoint. We're going to pass in that same query that I just ran from the command prompt, select these values from this object where uh, the key is this. And we go and run that. And it says, here we go. So he's been to 10, he's moved uh, 10 different times to six unique different places. And if we go and change something on the data side, so let's go and insert into movements and they're going to go to uh, Harrogate. Okay, so we've moved our location. Our application says, oh, I'd like to know where they are, or I'd like to know how many different places they've been to now. I'm going to reissue that query. It says, okay, they've been to 11 places, of which seven are unique. So by being able to take this materialized view, so let's remind ourselves what that looked like. We simply say create a table. It's a materialized view on top of this stream of events. Create the table. In this case, we're serializing the underpinning data as Avro, but it's, it's up to you. We're going to select our group by, our key. We're going to select these values from our source stream, group it by that, 
And that persists that state, it maintains that state within case equal db. The code for this, as I say, is on um, uh, GitHub. There's one other thing that I nearly forgot to show you, and that is how we can take this same data and we can push it out to an external system. So down here at the bottom, we're just going to check, because uh, it's a live demo, and it's always a good idea to, that case equal DB has got the connectors installed that I need to use. If I didn't, I'll just go and install them, because um, case equal DB can also run our Kafka Connect Worker. So here we've got the JDBC sync connector, which is what we're going to use. We're going to take data from case equal DB, and we're going to push it down to Postgres. So let's do that. So back into case equal DB now, uh, in our window at the top, and in case equal DB, oh, where's that gone? We're going to say create sync connector. I'm going to call it sync Postgres. We're going to push it down with the JDBC sync connector to Postgres, and we're going to say take the data from our person stats topic. And the topic is actually that materialized view. So the materialized view, I hope you're following along, is backed by a Kafka topic. So you can query that materialized view state directly, externally using a REST API, but that materialized view is also uh, persisted as a Kafka topic, and we can push that Kafka topic to other places. So here we're gonna push it down to Postgres, and we're gonna do an upset. We're gonna actually maintain that view within Postgres, which sounds more complicated than it actually is, because if we go and create that connector, say show connectors, and it says it's running, and then at the bottom of the screen here, we're actually going to go into Postgres and say, tell me about the tables, and it says I've got a table called person stats. So that sounds cool. Let's have a look at it. Select star from person stats. This is okay. This person, Robin, he's been he's moved location 11 times, seven of which were unique. It's like, oh, this information sounds familiar. Why does it sound familiar? Well, that's the data that we've got within case equal DB as well. Because if we go and select that from case equal DB, it says, well, here is that information. And if we go and insert, oops, let's do a, an insert. There's my clipboard gone. Here we go. Insert into the source event stream. And as I say, I'm populating it within case equal DB, but this source stream is built on a Kafka topic, which will be populated by anywhere by Kafka Connect upstream, by your producer API, by any data coming into Kafka, a new data arrives. It goes onto that stream. Within case equal DB, the state store updates, but also the Kafka topic underneath, which means Kafka Connect has pushed it down to Postgres, which means when we go to Postgres and say, tell me about this information, it says, well, here you go. Here's your information. And you'll notice I'm doing a select star, and that information is updated in place. We're not just kind of like dumping out all of the changes to Postgres, we're actually doing an upset based on the unique key, which in this case is the person field. So that's the kind of things that you can do with case equal DB. In a sense, it's a very, very simplistic example because it's just a very simple schema, but it hopefully, I tried to pair it back as much as possible to get across the, the basics without making it too Mickey Mouse as to kind of like be pointless. That's the idea anyway. So like I say, it's all on GitHub. So head over to uh, the demo scene repository, uh, which is here, so Confluent Inc, uh, demo scene, and you'll find uh, the code for this. Again, I put it on the, the um, talks.armoff.net as well. But with that, I'll tell you what, let's, let's do a few quick questions because I've seen Zoom uh, flashing away here. So if I can figure out how to uh, operate Zoom, which I could, never can do, let's have a quick look at the... Uh, chat. Okay, so I'm going to have a little uh, sip of a drink as well. So case equal DB only available in Kafka or Confluent. So case equal DB is part of Confluent platform. Uh, you can run it standalone as well. There's a, a standalone Docker image. So if you have Kafka already, um, that's not through Confluent platform, but you're running Apache Kafka through a different distribution or directly from Apache, you can still use case equal DB with it. Um, but if you want the whole uh, shebang as a platform, Confluent platform. Um, do you need Docker to use case equal DB to work on Windows? Uh, that's a good idea. Um, Confluent platform itself isn't supported on Windows. Kafka, I believe, uh, does work. I've seen a ton of problems that people have with it. So my go-to, and I don't use Windows myself, so other people may give a more informed answer, but my go-to answer for this is run Docker. It's just easier. Um, 
I've discovered that case equal db and Kafka appear to interfere with normal log analytics functions provided by the ELK stack. Can you provide some explanation to this anomaly? Not without better telepathic skills, I can't. Um, so if you, I, I'll share some links at the end, but one of them is the Confluent community, Confluent Slack community. There's a case equal db channel there, so come along and post details and it'd be cool to look into that. Um, can you associate a table with more than one Kafka topic? Yes, you can. Um, how easy is it to set up case equal db? Uh, Docker compose up um, is how you get started with it. There's, in fact, let me show you now. So case equal db, case equal db.io. Um, so it's like its own little community projects as well as being part of Confluent platform. So at case equal db.io, you've got a get started button, which goes to a quick start and walks you through. Here's actually getting started with it. Um, and another good one to go to is, if I can find it, developer.confluent.io. And on here, you've got a ton of different resources, one of which is Kafka Tutorials. And Kafka Tutorials also shows you, like, I want to do a bunch of different tasks, one of which might be like joining streams and tables together. How do I do it? So you can actually say, well, I'm going to use Kafka Streams because I'm a Java person. Actually, I'd like to use case equal DB for it because I just want to understand how it compares or whatever. And this walks you through actually using it, testing it, deploying it. So that's probably a good place to go to understand how easy is it to get set up. Um, does case equal DB require... Da, 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 da. Right, we're getting on to more detailed questions, which is a good prompt for me to go back to my slides because now we're going to talk about other stuff. So let me do that. Okay, right. Interactive with case equal DB. I showed you in the demo the command line. I'm a command line person. I like using the command line, so you can use that for it. Um, you can also use Confluent Control Center. So you can use case equal DB on Confluent Cloud. So you get the web interface then. Confluent Control Center, you can also run uh, as a developer license against a single Kafka broker. So you're running this on your laptop, uh, like I am doing for this demo. Confluent Control Center you can use for free there, uh, which gives you a web interface with case equal DB. It also does some cool things like with the, um, you can look at the flow of your data between the different tasks, uh, between the different objects, which is kind of neat. Um, there's also a REST API, which I showed you uh, with Postman. You can obviously use it from curl or from your own um, language of choice. There's also a native client being worked on. Um, so Apache Kafka has something called KIPS, Kafka Improvement Proposals. Uh, case equal DB has got CLIPS. So this is where the community writes out design documents, changes to APIs and so on for discussion before they actually uh, get uh, coded and committed to the project. So if you're interested in this, interested in the status of it, then follow along with that. Let's talk a little bit more now about what else you can do with case equal DB. So I'll just move my Zoom windows. Keynote and Zoom just don't seem to play nicely together. With case equal DB, I showed you some of the, the simple things, but simple, but still takes a bit of explaining because I don't want to rush through it. It's important to understand the basics. But once you've wrapped your head around this concept of case equal DB lets you take Kafka topics and interact with them and model them semantically in different ways and deal with state or deal with streams, you can do some really, really cool stuff with it. So one of these is you can actually do lockups against other data. So you might have a simple stream of events. You might have orders coming into your Kafka topic from wherever orders come from, whether from the producer API directly or Kafka Connect hooked up to a database to stream the events from there. You've got orders in a Kafka topic. But within those orders, you want to know more information about them. You've got this oh, item ID is item, I, item nine. What's that? We want to know more information about it. We've got that information elsewhere. We want to do a lookup against that item information. We want to denormalize that data because for item nine, it turns out that item ID is made by this particular company. It's got this particular unit cost. It's useful to know this particular order here, we ordered five of them. How much did they cost? Well, it turns out they cost this much. You can join these things together within k equal DB. You can simply say, well, it's a SQL statement. Select these fields from here, from these objects here with a join. So select all the units multiplied by the item cost as our total order value. Select it from our order stream, do an inner join to our items table in this case, because it's a key value lookup, it's state. So for a given key, our, our item ID key, what's the, the state? And our state is the maker model and unit cost currently. We can find that out based on our primary foreign key join. 
So you can do these kind of joins and write that out to a new Kafka topic. And that Kafka topic you can use in subsequent processing. You can also push it downstream to other systems. So this is one of the things that I showed in that demo uh, in the first week of this, the building streaming data pipelines. This idea of events from here and reference information from there may be pulled in with Kafka Connect from a database into a Kafka topic, join it, write it back to an enriched Kafka topic, and then push it downstream to Elasticsearch, for example, or Neo4j, or wherever else you want to put that, push that information. So I mentioned just now, connecting KSQL DB out to other systems, getting lookup information from a database or getting fact information from a database, enriching that information, pushing it down to Elasticsearch, pushing it down to a different database, pushing it to wherever we want to do so. And KSQL DB, because it integrates with Kafka Connect, can do so directly with all these other systems. So you've got data sat in Oracle, in uh, an MQTT, or in a different message queue, or in Postgres, or wherever you've got your data sat. You can stream that into Kafka. You can process it with KSQL DB. You can push it out to numerous different targets. Anywhere for which there's support from Kafka Connect, and there's like hundreds of different connectors, you can just plug these in and start working with them in KSQL DB. You can say, create a source connector, pull in data from this particular table. I'd like to stream data from this table, take a snapshot from this table, and capture every single subsequent change into a Kafka topic. And we can use that in our stream processing against other things which are going on. And then we can say, create a sync connector, take data from this topic, that we've populated with KSQL DB and push it down to these other different targets. Right, time for a little bit of theory because I talked about streams and tables in the demo that I did and it may have made sense then, hopefully it did, but don't feel bad if it didn't because it's a little bit mind bending because if we work with databases on their own, like RDBMSs, it's like it's a static lump of data, it's just a table that we can like, we know and love. And if we're doing kind of like messaging systems and we're thinking like we've got streams or we've got queues and stuff like that and they're standalone things and Kafka gives us this event streaming platform which actually stores the data but as a stream of events and how do we actually bring these things together and work with them in a way which makes sense. So underpinning everything within KSQL DB is a Kafka topic. Everything in KSQL DB is actually a Kafka topic in one form or another. And Kafka topics themselves are just key value bytes. It's up to the producer how that gets serialized onto the topic. Within KSQL DB, we have two different types of objects. We have a stream, and a stream is simply the topic plus a schema. It's the topic, and then we say we're going to deserialize it using Avro or Protobuf or whatever, and there's a schema whether we have to type it in, if we're just using JSON or CSV, whether it's actually there for us in the schema registry, if we're using Avro or Protobuf and so on. As well as a stream, we also have a table. And a table is a little bit different because it's the state for a key. And also it's backed by a topic and there must be a schema also. But instead of a stream simply being this unbounded series of events, a table is built on those events, but it rolls them up into state per key. So let's see what that actually looks like. These are the kind of things that we worked with in the demo. We had a timestamp and we had a person and we had their location. Where is this person now? It gets produced onto the topic through whatever means it gets produced onto the topic. And from that, we can model it as a KSQL DB stream, which says, well, here's the event, but it's got a schema. So we can select those different fields and we can see it as a table. This particular person, where are they? What's the current state for that key? So after the first event, they kind of all look the same. It's like, well, Robin, and he's in Leeds. But then we have another event comes along, and then the table actually updates in place, whereas the stream gets a new row added to it because there's been a new event, and so on and so on. Each time we get a new event arriving, we get a new message on the stream, but the table, because they're all for the same key, the table simply changes its state because it's state for a given key. If we had a different person come along, so kind of like Bob comes along and we track Bob's location, we'd have two different rows in that KSQL DB table because it's based on the key, and the key in our case here is the person. And we also saw in that demo how you can use tables to store aggregates. So in this case, again, we've got the same series of events coming in, but we're declaring two different aggregates on top of that stream of data. 
So we're saying for each event that comes in, we would like to summarize it up. We'd like to select how many times has this person moved location, how many events have there been associated with this given person. And we can also say how many unique events, the count distinct against location. So how many unique locations have there been across those different events. So the first one comes in, there's just one location change and therefore one unique location. And then they move somewhere else and they move somewhere else. We've got three different movements and three different places. You can see on the left hand side, you've been to Leeds, they've been to London, they've been to Wakefield. But then they go back to another place, which means there'll be four different location changes because we've got four different events, but only three of them were unique. So K SQL DB is building and persisting these aggregates. So with these aggregates, we can take those selects and we can persist it as a table. And that table actually exists as a state within key SQL DB, and we can query that table. So we can take a stream of events in a Kafka topic. We declare our materialized view. So here's our materialized view. We're materializing this into a view in effect. And any event that arrives on the Kafka topic updates that view, updates that state store. And we can query that state store using the pull query. So it goes to it, it says, what's the state? And it returns. Or we can also query that state store and say, as it changes, I want to know about it. And the difference being the flashing cursor. On the left-hand side, query terminated. What's the current state? And you're done. On the right-hand side, what are the changes to that state? And if it changes again, I'll tell you, but you're not getting control back because you asked me to tell you every time that state changes. And that state we can query as well as within KSQL DB, the command line prompt. We can also query directly used in the REST API. And because it's a REST API, anything can query it. So we've got a service, it's going to use a curl request out to KSQL DB. It's going to say, tell me how many different locations were there for this particular user. So there's our row key there. So we're uh, unique locations where row key is Robin. KSQL DB replies with, well, it was three. Here is the current state for that given key that you've asked for. So we have these two different query types. We have a pull query and a push query. A pull query is where we're going to KSQL DB and saying, tell me what the value is at the moment in this state store that we've declared with that materialized view and it exits immediately. The current value and your return. Whereas a push query tells us all of the changes to the values and it doesn't exit. It simply just feeds us those changes as they arrive. So how does all of this actually work? Well, that's not actually the subject for this talk. This is an introduction to KSQL DB. It's already been a while yet. All I'll kind of go into here is a little teaser of, of the information. There's a ton of stuff online. Go and look for the Kafka Summit recordings because there's some deep dives in there as well. But you always want to know kind of like what's going on under the covers a little bit just to kind of get a mental model of what's going on. As I said, KSQL DB, it's a consumer and a producer of Kafka topics. Under the covers, KSQL DB runs as a JVM process. It uses Kafka Streams API, which we talked about earlier. So Kafka Streams, part of Apache Kafka, it's a Java library that you can use in your own applications. But KSQL DB generates Kafka Streams applications and Kafka Streams uses RocksDB for the kind of uh, the stateful elements. And that's kind of a glimpse of what's going on under the covers. For a much more deep dive on that, go and look at Kafka Summit and the recordings that are online from previous uh, instances where some really good deep dives. But because KSQL DB is a JVM, it means that we can kind of run KSQL DB wherever we want because KSQL DB, we definitely don't run it on the Kafka brokers. Nothing runs on the Kafka brokers except for your Kafka broker. Maybe Zookeeper, but plenty of people would disagree with that. So just like your own applications, just like Kafka Connect, KSQL DB runs on its separate instance. Or if you do the cool thing, Confluent Cloud, and we run it for you. So I'm obliged to say Confluent are uh, paying for me to be here this evening. They even sponsored my cool t-shirts. Confluent Cloud is a managed Kafka service, but you also get managed Kafka Connect. You also get managed KSQL. So then you simply fire it up. You get a Kafka endpoint to send your data to. You get a KSQL DB that you can go and create your cool stuff in. So go and check out Confluent Cloud. If you want to run it yourself, you can. It's just a JVM process. You can install it as part of Confluent Platform. You can also run it uh, standalone, there's uh, Docker images, there's all sorts of ways of running it, however you would like to. 
when it comes to deploying KSQL DB and understanding what KSQL DB looks like for deployments, it's important to understand quite how you should go about it. So KSQL DB, it can run as a single process. Okay, so on my, my laptop here for this demo environment, I've got a single Kafka broker, I've got a single KSQL DB process, and that's obviously no use whatsoever if my laptop crashes and I lose everything. In the real world, our Kafka brokers are scaled out and resilient and fault tolerant. It's a distributed system. We have like three or five brokers or however many we need. And the same with KSQL DB. So we can have a single instance or we can cluster it. And we can cluster it for both resilience and throughput. So we've got tons of data coming through. We partition our source topics appropriately. KSQL DB scales out and each instance of KSQL DB within the cluster will get allocated part of that workload. But we don't just think, well, KSQL DB, it's shown as the cluster here, we'll just have a KSQL DB cluster. You absolutely do not just have one KSQL DB cluster unless you're just like starting out and just prototyping with it. Don't think of KSQL DB as like, oh, well, it's like my new analytics warehouse. And just as we've got like transactional systems and then like a big analytics warehouse with like one big cluster that we scale and scale and scale, KSQL DB is not that. KSQL DB is about building applications, applications to filter your order data as it arrives to create new derived streams, applications to, put, to build a materialized view that your application can query the state from. So KSQL DB is much more about thinking about applications and clusters of those applications. So you might have your Kafka cluster and hanging off that Kafka cluster, you may have multiple different instances of KSQL DB. You might have one which handles fraud processing or which does the inventory processing or orders. It's up to you. However you deploy your applications, it's the similar mental model for how you're going to deploy KSQL DB. Now, one thing which makes people nervous is thinking, well, this is like SQL. And historically, when you let people loose with SQL, they can do horrible things to the database. They can write queries that bring down production and DBAs get kind of quite rightly protective of these things. And with KSQL DB, this is, it's a good idea to be aware of this, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be hooking up KSQL DB to your Kafka clusters. KSQL DB is just a Kafka consumer. So in the same way that when you write an application, you make sure it behaves correctly, you do the same thing with KSQL DB. But if you want, you can also think about deploying it against separate Kafka clusters. So you may start off with one KSQL DB cluster connecting to one Kafka cluster, but then you say, well, that's doing my, like, my real um, super uh, high value important processing. It's like its own uh, order processing application. And there's my, my um, orders Kafka cluster, but there's other stuff. Maybe we're doing some machine learning or some model scoring or something like that against that data in the Kafka cluster but we don't want to let KSQL DB run against that. In the same way, we wouldn't let other applications run against it. So you say, well, let's set up a second Kafka cluster. And this is what organizations do anyway, regardless of KSQL DB. Let's create a second Kafka cluster, and we're going to replicate data, some data or all data from our primary one to our secondary one. So now we've got a secondary Kafka cluster kept in sync um, exactly using Confluent Replicator. And now with that, we can have other KSQL DB applications connecting to it. So it's entirely up to you how you deploy it. So KSQL DB or Kafka streams? This is a question that always comes up. I can guess, given the, the uh, London Java community audience, which way people are going to maybe veer on this. KSQL DB does various things. Kafka streams does various things. Both of them are tightly integrated with Apache Kafka. How do you choose? There's different ways to choose, but one of them is to understand exactly what functionality sits where. So at the kind of the bottom of the pyramid, you have the consumer and producer APIs for Apache Kafka, the lowest level APIs with which you can do whatever you can imagine, because these are the lowest level APIs. The next layer up from that, uh, the next abstraction up from that is the Kafka Streams API. Part of Apache Kafka, it's a Java library. It actually gives you the kind of the concept of streams and tables. You'll see K streams, K tables there on the right hand side. So you can start to think about materializing states and stuff like that, but you have to write Java programs to do so. And then on top of Kafka Streams, the next abstraction on top of that is KSQL DB. KSQL DB is built on Kafka Streams. So anything that you can do in Kafka Streams, 
sorry, anything that you can do in k sql db, you can do in Kafka streams because that's how it runs. But it doesn't work the other way. There are some things that Kafka streams does that k sql db won't yet do. k sql db is catching up. There's various things which get added into Kafka streams and then k sql db soon offers. So k sql db 0 0.9 uh, was released today and it's just added in the ability to do multi-way joins. So that was added into Kafka streams a while ago and now it's available in k sql db. Sometimes a useful way to bridge the gap between the functionality that you've got in KSQL DB, which because it's SQL is much more accessible to a much broader audience of developers and users, whereas Kafka Streams obviously have to write Java code, is to say, well, there's a particular thing we want to be able to do in KSQL DB, it doesn't offer it yet. Well, you could Java developers, you people, could go and write UDFs, UDAFs, UDTFs, table functions, aggregate functions, to enable people to use KSQL DB to access specific functionality that's not necessarily available in it yet. So you see people developing all these cool UDFs like counting the number of emojis in a particular message or doing geodistance funky stuff uh, around the data coming through Kafka. So you then enable your broader user base to write stream processing applications using SQL, using KSQL DB, but accessing this uh, enriched functionality that UDFs can expose to them. Couple more things before I wrap up and do some questions. In terms of deploying KSQL DB, we've talked about how you lay out a topology of uh, servers and clusters and so on. But from an application development point of view, you build your code using the command line interface, using a web interface, and you come up with a set of SQL statements. And you do exactly as I did in the demo, and you're typing in bits of SQL and seeing what works, and you have your selects, and then you prepend, create stream as select, and that's now building Kafka topics. And from that, you end up with a set of SQL statements. And those SQL statements, you kind of take into a file and you put into source control and so on. And those you deploy to your production KSQL DB cluster, which may be a single node or you may cluster it for scalability using the REST API. So you use the REST API to post a bunch of create statements, which then sets up the application. So one of the really nice things about KSQL DB is there is no boilerplate. So you want to say, I've got a stream here that's in JSON and I'd like to re-serialize it to Avro. Or I've got a stream that's Avro, I want to re-serialize it to Protobuf, or I've got a stream of orders, I want exactly the same thing, but just filtering for this condition. Those are just single KSQL statements. So create stream as select from here. And that's all you deploy to KSQL DB. There's no kind of like stuff, there's no fluff, there's no boilerplate that you have to put around it in order to get the application to run. You simply need a KSQL DB endpoint and you send your KSQL DB statement over the REST API. So create this stream here as select star from there. And now you've set your application running. You've written an application, you'll want to monitor it. So you can do that using Confluent Control Center, which I mentioned already. There's also JMX uh, metrics available uh, to kind of like a lower level as well. So Confluent Control Center, you also get that in Confluent Cloud. So if you want to know some more, um, the great place to go is Confluent Developer. So I, I pointed, I showed this briefly earlier on, developer.confluent.io. You've got blogs, you've got videos, you've got tutorials. So like the, the ones which I showed you, where it says here are all the different types of things you might want to do. I want to filter a stream, I want to join a stream, I want to do windowed aggregations, all of this kind of stuff. And it gives you examples in the different APIs. So here's how it would look like to filter a stream using the producer and consumer API directly. So like a low level integration. Here's how it would look like if you want to use Kafka streams. Here's how it would look like in KSQL DB. And the point with all of this is that it actually gives you usable examples. It's not just bleeding chunks of code that you then need to figure out. It actually says, here's how you try it out. Here's how you build your test case. Here's how you deploy it. The Confluent Community Slack group is a fantastic resource. There's a mailing list as well, which I missed the link off here, but it's a Google group. Uh, you can find it or tweet me for the address. But the Slack group, um, you presumably all know Slack. It's an online chat forum. There's different channels. There's a KSQL DB channel. There's a Connect channel. So really, really uh, active, vibrant community. So this is a great place to go to go and learn more, ask more, help other people with Kafka, Confluent Platform, KSQL DB. And Finally, if you'd like to know more about Kafka, if you want to know more about the kind of the architecture ideas around it, the fundamentals of why logs are so powerful, you can get these eBooks for free uh, off our website. 
So you go to the URL, you scan the QR code, um, and you can download those for free. So I'll do questions in a moment. Um, I will tweet the slide links. So there's my Twitter, at armoff. Um, do tweet me, tell me if you enjoyed the session, tell me if you'd have liked to see something done differently, tell me if there are other sessions that you'd like to see. Uh, but it's always good getting that kind of feedback. But follow me on Twitter and I'll tw tweet the links to these books, I'll tweet the links to the slides. Also the recording when it's online, I'll tweet that uh, recording detail as well. So I'll leave it on the screen um, whilst I do a few of these questions. So let me put that there so you can still see that. And bring the chat window up here. And we'll see what we've got. So uh, can you run key SQL queries? Can you run key SQL queries from Java? That's a good question. So there is no embedded key SQL DB as such. But what there is, um, is this idea of a native client for key SQL DB. So if you go and look up uh, clip 15, so that one is this one here. So clip 15, uh, you'll find these on the key SQL DB GitHub uh, repository. And this goes into like the ideas for actual native clients. There's also the REST API, which I showed you. So Java or any other language can make a REST call out to your key SQL DB server uh, to run queries from there. So you can do push queries and pull queries. Um, what about joins? Yes, you can do joins. Um, can you post the, the URLs for the tutorials in the chat window? Yes, let me do that now. Uh, send it to everyone. That's the uh, tutorials. Um, if I have a stream with lots of events for the same key happening in a short time, can I use KSQLDB to generate another stream which will contain a maximum of one message per 10 minutes and still be up to date? Uh, I think, yes. So with KSQLDB, you have windowed aggregations. So a windowed aggregation could be a, a tumbling window or a hopping window or a session window. Developer.confluent.io goes into examples of those different ones and give you the documentation. But if you set up a, a tumbling 10 minute window, that would be an aggregate based on it per key. So you could say, I would like to see kind of like the maximum value or the latest value or whatever for each key. And, it would, and you would then get one message per 10 minute slice. Uh, how does it support various data types in source systems like uh, SQL Server, especially decimal numeric? Um, so Kafka Connect supports um, ingesting decimals and numerics from upstream systems. Um, KSQLDB supports decimals. With Kafka Connect and the connectors, there's sometimes the settings that you need to change to say exactly how you want those to be handled. Um, so there, it does support it, but you sometimes have to fiddle with the settings a little bit. Again, the Slack community, let me put the link on the screen, uh, is a great place to go to ask about that. Uh, if you get stuck uh, on the, uh, the links for that. Uh, in, what way, in what way is a materialized view different from a table? So I use materialized view because it's a view on the data that is materialized. But what it's materialized as is a table. So I'm kind of mixing my terminology because materialized view is a concept that lots of people understand understand the idea of a relational database and something happens in a table, I'm going to create a materialized view off of that, which will be fed by events from that table, and it will instantiate as a new table over here, materialized view over here. In case equal DB, we're taking a stream of events and we're declaring a materialized view on top of that, which is just an aggregate of that stream of events, aggregated based on various keys or uh, minimums, maximums, sums, latest, whatever, and that aggregate is materialized into an actual state store. There's a state store and that's what you can query. So that's why we talk about the concept of materialized view, but the materialized view is a KSQLDB table. Can we use connectors in KSQLDB for production load? Yes. So KSQLDB has got an embedded Kafka Connect worker if you want, or you could just point it at your Kafka Connect cluster and you can cluster Kafka Connect and have multiple workers within that. Uh, if you don't know what I mean by workers, go and check out last week's talk, which was called From Zero to Hero with Kafka Connect, and it goes into what Kafka Connect uh, looks like. Uh, is Confluent Cloud CLI the only interface with Confluent Cloud, or what other options are there? That's a good question, and one to which I don't know the answer. But if you go to the Slack group, there is a channel called uh, hashtag Confluent Cloud, Confluent Dash Cloud, and someone there will be able to help you. 
Uh, how do materialized views in case equal DB differ from materialized views in a relational database? I think I've answered. Um, I think I've answered. So come back to me on Twitter or whatever if I didn't properly. Are all the connectors in Kafka or Confluent? So Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka. Kafka Connect is a framework, it's an API, and the plugins for Kafka Connect um, vary in their licensing. So um, the JDBC source and sync are Confluent community licensed. There are proprietary ones, there are community ones, there are Apache ones, there are all sorts of ones. It depends on how the author has licensed it. Uh, but if you go to Confluent Hub, so let me uh, show you this. So I'll put the, uh, the link in the chat as well. So Confluent Hub um, is where you go to, as it says, discover Kafka connectors and more. Um, and from there, you can say, here's the technology and it'll actually tell you, uh, so this one here, Kafka Connect GCP Pub Sub, it's a commercial license. There'll be other ones. Uh, I think you can even filter by license as well. So which ones are free to use and so on. Um, is there an API that allows it to operate on data in a strongly typed manner? So this is where I get like, a little bit hazy because I'm not a hardcore programmer, but what I understand by that is do you declare the types on the data and in case equal DB you have to. There are schemas and you have to say this field here is a varchar, this is a big int and there are certain data types that case equal DB supports and if the data isn't it'll probably just come through as a null um, or get chucked out. If I'm wrong in that understanding please someone correct me in chat um, or ping me on uh, Twitter. Right a couple more questions. Um, uh, uh, is it possible to enforce access control policies against KSQL DB REST API? Uh, yes. Can you disable the REST API? Uh, I guess you could stick a, a firewall on it, um, but that's how you integrate with it. So if you think about deploying and then locking it down, you yeah you work around it with a firewall. Can you create KSQL DB stream table on a protobuf topic? Yes, you can. I'm delighted to say. So as of Confluent Platform 5.5 which dropped a couple of weeks ago. The schema registry, uh, which is Confluent Community Licensed, um, it now supports uh, Protobuf, it supports JSON schemas, it already supported Avro. So KSQL DB can make use of that um, to, to read data that's in Protobuf. So KSQL DB, all you actually need is Apache Kafka brokers, but if you want to use Avro, Protobuf, JSON schema, you also need the Confluent schema registry to uh, make it work with that. Right. Um, I think uh, that's done. We're kind of like we're over time. So uh, you'll find all the links uh, on the talk. There's my uh, Twitter handle. Follow me on Twitter. I'll, I'll tweet the links there as well. Uh, thank you very much for everyone's time. Thank you very much also to RecWorks for, for sponsoring, for hosting this event. Uh, it's very good of them to do so. Uh, so have a good evening, everyone, and thank you very much.